it's a Series 1 Sunbeam Alpine, uh, South African car, so right hand drive, very early one, it's about the 3,000th and 3,100th off the production line, I can't remember what year it is, 50 something when they came out. Initially, the clutch jammed up um, and not knowing what it was, I went round to the guy's house and just this was wedged in the gearbox you can see that's been made you can see the end of that has been welded or god knows till i put it all back together i don't know but um the issue being basically there was a bit missing off the clutch plate the thrust bearings either caught or fallen off i would say it's fallen off this it's a it's a it's a sunbeam alpine but it's got a series 3a sunbeam rapier engine in it which basically they're all the same they're a roots group engine but it, it's the wrong engine so when you're trying to order the parts it's all cross-referencing and playing around you know but this is called a thrust bearing so that should sit in that fork there like that yeah when you put your foot on the clutch it slides along the first motion shaft pushes this diaphragm and that releases the pressure on the clutch plate so that clutch plate is sandwiched between the flywheel and your pressure plate when you push down on that on your clutch pedal that draws that inner face there that one off so this can spin freely yeah mm -hmm and that's your clutch so it's disengaging the gearbox from the engine yeah. when you put your foot on the clutch so you can change gear release it that all tightens back up and you've got driven it's called your driven plate clearly i think this looking at pictures this, it, this is totally wrong completely wrong for a sunbeam alpine so I don't quite know what it's out of, or the clutch plate is, is right, it's an eight inch with 10 splines. This, I think, should have another piece of metal in here. Yeah, a nice big piece. But then that's your rotating thrust bearing, yeah? Yeah. That sits on that. It's obviously the engine spinning, pushes it round. Now clearly, something has fallen off of there, bent all of this up, smash the arm to pieces but see this this should bolt straight to the back of the gearbox you've got your bell housing gearbox there that space has been made to go in there which i think is because the original clutch plates were a lot deeper the original cover plate was a lot deeper so hence that would be further back yeah so they've replaced it with this put those spacers in probably welded that up to make that adjustment right i don't honestly know till i get all the new parts i've got to go over this morning i found an exchange one of these and the exchange thrust bearing and i found an arm from another company up north that they're sending down with the pedestal because that's also added so these parts can have to be replaced there's not no oh, no you can't do anything with it no it's, it's gone <coughs> Now that it's, it, the stupid thing is it's a brand new clutch so whoever's assembled it hasn't got it right but like i say i think i think looking at pictures right so there's your thrust bearings see these are what they call a graphite bearing yeah mm -hmm. not a rotational bearing if you look at that clutch cover plate look see that big piece of metal in the middle yeah Clearly, that hasn't got one. That's your original style. So it's one of these. So see, this is the difference. You've got thrust bearing for an Alpine 1, 2 and 3. Thrust bearing for an Alpine 4 or 5. Alpine 3, 4 and 5, 1 and 2. I'm guessing it's a 3 because it's a Series 3A rapier engine so until i can go and look at it all and try and work out what fits what yeah you know but luckily we've got a local guy who does all this only over at shoreham so i can shoot over there 
There's me merrily thinking I could get the gearbox out. But that didn't work. So I had to take it out from there, which providing I can get enough back on the new, to get the new cover plate in, we're, we're okay. I can do it all. Yeah, you thought it had a 1275 Series 5 engine in it. But doing the numbers checks and stuff like that, it's not, like I say, it's not even a Sunbeam Alpine engine. But that dipstick tube there donates, it's a one, two, three or four with a three bearing crankshaft. But if this dipstick hole went straight into the block, then it's a series five with a five bearing crankshaft. But all I can do is get the parts and, and see what we can yeah. get together again, you know. And how did he say the car performed? Um, he said it went okay, but obviously lacking in power. Um, but having taken the carburetors apart, I can see why. I'm surprised yeah. it even ran, to be perfectly honest with you. You have what's in the carburetors, you have an accelerator pump, so when you put your foot on the throttle, it gives it a shot of petrol down each carburetor, you know, like um, just to stop it stalling, you know, it's fluttering, flat spot. But they have, they have to have a check ball in them. Yeah. Because under load, the vacuum drawing will just suck neat fuel straight into the carburetor. So he was saying as he was going up Goodwood Hill the other day, it got, well, sort of went down to 10 mile an hour, which it will do, because it's just chucking neat fuel straight into it. So I've replaced those, rebuilt the carburetors, reset all the float levels, which were miles out. Um, reset all the chokes. One was had the choke on the carburetor, the other one was off. But the guy didn't even know it had a choke on it. So we found the lever for that. It's in the middle of the centre console for some strange reason. Wow. So the carburetors were yeah, horrible. And you have, when I first started it, I poured some petrol down each bore to, um, just to get it fired up, because I didn't know where the choke was at the time. And it, it basically, it, it just poured petrol out of here and here. So when I took them apart, These screws here hold the base to the carburetor body. None of them were done up. Nice. So if it's pouring petrol out, it's sucking air in. So like I say, I'm surprised it even ran, to be perfectly honest with you. So they go like that. And you've got a throttle arm that comes to there. The carburetors are linked there. So that is your only throttle opening there. But it transfers over to that one. The choke bar goes between the two chokes. So that's choke on, choke on. So they put the choke cable through here. You could only pull it about that far. So it's basically it's not doing anything. That one was there where it was set. This one was over here. So it was running on choke on that carburetor, on the front carb. Yeah, so a bit of a Bit of a poor old lady, I think. Basically, because it's convertible, you have here what's called a, a cross frame underneath, an X frame. That's your main strength of your car. Yeah? But your outer seals are structural as well. Now, these have been pop riveted on. Which really is not the way to go, by any way or form. But you can see the body line here. So yeah, those seals have gone on. That's because they've, I think, looking at it, they've gone over the top of the original outer seal and just pop riveted them on. You can see the bow in it. That comes along, straight line, straight line, straight line, dips down. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See that should be a dead straight line on the seals. Um, so I restored one from my dad quite a few years ago now. You know, if you if you did all the body work properly and put some new seals on it and got the door gaps right, yeah, quite a nice car, but you're into a money pit again, you know. Is there any money in them though? Any value to them? Yeah, not a massive amount. No, I don't really I suppose a good one now of probably twenty, I suppose. It'd have to be pretty good though. Um they did what's called a Sunbeam Tiger with a 260 or a 289 V8 in it. They're worth big money now. Yeah, quite rare. 
floor spipes hanging off. Gotta put a bolt in that for him. Because it's a forward hinging bonnet, they get rust in here. And I remember doing Dad's one, trying to get the bonnet to line up because his was rotten. It was just horrible, horrible, horrible job. The cross, that side of the, where the um, X member is, that's all smashed to pieces. It's had a hard life, I think. But generally, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty solid. Normally, there's nothing left of any of this. Most of these, if you put it on a ramp like that, they disintegrate. Really? Oh, yeah, they're horrible things. Sorry, Sunbeam moaners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dad's one had, had bent in half, basically. I had to cut it all the way through here. Right the way along to get it to go all back up again so you could get a door gap on it. It's my Zephyr engine. 39 Buick, my Zephyr. Dad's Buick. Dad's BSA I rebuilt. Very young me, skinny. Wow, look at you. 1988 that was. Right, that's my TVR. I was skinny once. Who is that? <laughs> Long time ago, mate. Now I'm just fat and old. Funny, isn't it, looking back? <laughs> that's my nephew, Joe. He's 30. That's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Look, skinny. Wow. <laughs> That's a waistline. Yeah. My dad, when he was younger. This is this is this was dad's one, the series five. That's a series one. Yeah. Nice though. Yeah, it's a nice car when it was done. Yeah, it's that scuttle plate there is an absolute pig of a thing to change yeah I made all the interior for that that's how it can look then yeah yeah it came out well that one my uncle Len from Australia but you can see what I go on about door gaps all the time, the difference. Mm. Just makes it so much neater. So much neater, isn't it? Yeah. That was when it was sprayed down at Riverside. That's when he got it. Went to Wales to get that. Bit of a transformation, isn't it? Yeah. Very good. Well, that's good to see. Yeah, it came out well, that one. It was a nice car.